When I say the word cranberries, you're probably thinking Thanksgiving, cranberry salad, cranberry juice, or maybe this. It turns out that cranberries have a vital role in the food history of 17th and 18th century America. Cranberries were delicious and they played a part in being a very healthy food. In fact, almost medicinal. Let's dig into this important founding food in early America. For hundreds of years before any Europeans came to North America, the Native Americans were harvesting and eating and using cranberries for medicinal purposes. They were harvesting them in all kinds of places in North America because there are multiple kinds of varieties that grow in different regions. So all the way up from Canada down into the Carolinas, you will find something like a cranberry. So we know today that they're full of vitamin C. So they're just generally healthy for you. And there are references even in 1670s about these being good for scurvy. So they knew that scurvy was a problem, something you could fix with your diet, and that cranberries were one of the very things that would cure that. The classic American cranberry we're used to grows in the New England region, but other varieties of cranberries grow all the way from Russia into other parts of Europe and Great Britain. They do vary a little bit in their size and their color, but they're similar in their flavor. One of the characteristics or benefits of the cranberry is that they were completely in the wild. You didn't have to work on a cranberry crop. You just went out and harvested them at the proper time of year. So it was sort of like a free food source. Cranberries need a very specific kind of environment. They need an acidic peat soil with a lot of sand, a lot of water, and a long growing season. If you combine these elements together, you'll have an abundance of cranberries, someplace you can easily harvest as many as you need. Early in the 17th century, it seems that the Native Americans are the ones that are going out into these difficult to traverse bogs to harvest these cranberries and bring them into the settlements and towns to sell to the people that are there. As I was doing my research, it was really hard to tell if the Native Americans had to sell the idea of cranberries to the people that were coming in, the Europeans, or whether the Europeans already had a desire for them. The chances are that the Europeans were already at least familiar with cranberries, and we see cranberries being sold. We have documents of cranberries being sold as early as 1648 to the colonists. Now the earliest North American reference that I can find for cranberries is from 1647. And we have a missionary, John Elliot, and he writes this, Why are strawberries sweet and cranberries sour? There is no reason but the wonderful work of God that made them so. Starting in 1672, we see references of cranberries popping up more. In the book New England Rarities, they talk about cranberries. They say, The Indians and the English use them much, boiling them with sugar for a sauce to eat with their meat. It is a delicate sauce, especially for roasted mutton, and some make tarts of them as with gooseberries. So 25 years after the first reference we have for cranberries in North America, we have a recipe here that is exactly what we would use cranberries for today. A cranberry sauce that's basically just cranberries and sugar and water. So we might think that cranberries were like pumpkins and that they were a lowly food, but I don't think that is true. We have a couple of different reasons to base on the idea that they're an expensive food. One of them is what happens in 1677. In Massachusetts, the colony has been bad. They have allowed the coining of money, which they didn't really have permission to do, and they want to make it back up to the king. They want to send King Charles II a present, so they send the very best that they've got. They send barrels of codfish, they send barrels of samp, which is made out of corn, and 10 barrels of cranberries. It wasn't a joke. They were trying to be nice. There's another reason why I think this cranberry sauce was high end. And that is if we look in the English cookbooks of the 18th century, we might not find recipes for cranberry sauce, but we will find references in their diagrams of banquet tables. They'll show you what to put on the banquet table and where. So put your pheasant here, put your green beans there, and then right there in the middle, cranberry sauce, usually right beside pheasant. 
It wasn't until 1816 that people tried to farm cranberries. Before that, all the cranberries were wild harvested. Peter Kalm talks about cranberries in 1748 in his journals when he's in North America. And he says that they make them into a jelly and that they're very prolific. They're brought into the market on Wednesdays and Saturdays and that there are so many cranberries that they are preserved in barrels and shipped to Europe and to the West Indies. It's kind of crazy that these cranberries were so popular that we were able to preserve them and ship them into Europe before we even started farming them. Another great part about the cranberries is that even though you harvest them in a very kind of short time period, they preserve well and you can have them basically all year round. We preserve them in a couple of different ways. You can make them into a jelly, but it's so much easier. These cranberries just preserve in a bottle or a jar. So if you wanted to preserve them for a long period of time, you might submerge them in water, but that's it. Basically a bottle or a barrel full of water, you put these cranberries in and they're gonna last a long time. And then many of the other references, well, you just put them dry into a bottle and seal it well. That's it. Some people said they would last for up to two years. I don't think they're gonna last that long, but maybe what they think of as lasting for a long time. Also, they would last quite a while right there in the bog. Some people liked the cranberries better the spring after they were ripe. So they would sit in the bog all winter long, sort of frozen. Maybe they would, you know, unfreeze and freeze again. That would change their flavor and make them a little sweeter. And some people thought that was the best flavor of all. We're going to make the two most popular cranberry dishes of the time period, a wonderful cranberry sauce and a delicious cranberry tart. Let's go back to that 1677 journal and let's make a cranberry sauce. We're gonna take our cranberries and stew them. I'm gonna slice these guys in half, put them in water, and we're gonna simmer them until they release their juices. So today we can put any kind of sauce we want on our meat. We've got ketchups and barbecue sauces and all kinds of vinegar and mustard, whatever you want, the sky's the limit. They had very few choices for the kinds of sauces. They had to make their sauces. And this cranberry sauce is one that was so popular in the time period that they would use it for virtually any kind of meat. Sometimes it was even a joke that they would use it on something like fish or lobster. Yes, it was that popular. For our cranberry tart recipe, we're going to Amelia Simmons's American Cookery Cookbook from 1796. This cookbook is wonderful because it is full of Thanksgiving Day recipes, basically. And it is the first American cookbook that was written by somebody in America, not just printed here. So it's got recipes for turkey and pumpkin pie and squash pudding that's perfect for Thanksgiving. And also we have a cranberry tart. It doesn't have a cranberry sauce, but if you read this cranberry tart recipe, you almost have exactly the same thing. It says, and this is the shortest recipe ever, cranberry tarts. Stewed, strained, and sweetened. Put into a paste, bake gently. That's it. She's basically making a cranberry sauce and then she's putting it in a tart dish. So that's what we're gonna do for our cranberry tart. I love digging into these seemingly simple topics like cranberries. We think it's just going to be a quick and easy research project and it just goes deeper and deeper and we find out how important cranberries were to 17th and 18th century America, how important they were as a food source and how important they were for the health of the people that are settling in North America. Our cranberry tart is ready to taste. And I think about this in the context of a meal in the 18th century and how right at the end of this meal, you have this massive boost of flavor that comes in. It's just mind blowing how, how intense something like this is at the end of the meal. And this is essentially exactly how we would make it today. Let's try it out. The crust is there and it balances this out perfectly. The tartness of the cranberries all comes together and it gives us a great combination flavor. The perfect ending to any meal. 